Yeah. Old as it we've seen. We've seen him. Seasoned. Mm -hmm. I heard you in terms of how we're going to. I figured I'm out of here. Good choice. Well, we're going to get started. Look at this 13, 20, 25. I can go knock on the door I'll again. I was going to say, I can go knock on the door. I can watch the trends. Tom Wolf for the red light. It doesn't really bother me. Wow. Really? It's locked. Maybe they're afraid of looking up. We're going. All right, we're going. <laughs> Good evening and welcome to the February 21st, 2017 meeting of the Town of Scarborough Planning Board. Would you please rise for the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. <clears throat> Karen, could you please take the roll? Mr. Duperry? Ms. Hendrickson? Here. Ms. Saunders? Here. Saunders? Saunders and Oglas sound a lot alike. Especially from way down here. <laughs> Sorry. Mr. Fellows? Here. Mr. McGee? Here. Mr. Bealey? Here. And Ms. Oglas? Here. Thank you. Uh, just for the record, in the absence of uh, Ms. Saunders and Mr. Duperry, Ms. Hendrickson will be a voting member this evening. And the next item on the agenda is approval of the minutes from the January 30th, 2017 meeting. Move to approve the minutes. Second. Any discussion? All in favor? That's unanimous, thank you. First action item, Matthew Chamberlain requests a sketch plan review for a subdivision at 203 Holmes Road, assessor's map R23, Lot 16. Jay? Yep. Thank you, Mr. Chair. As you noted, this is a sketch plan, so this is an informal application. It's really just the beginning of a discussion between the app opportunity for the applicant to present the concept of what they're looking and proposing to develop and for the board to provide guidance and any issues that you might see uh, you want the applicant to really uh, delve into any deeper than might they might normally with a formal application. Um, this is a piece of property off the Holmes Road, which is in the Rural and Farming District, as well as the Aquifer Protection Overlay District. Uh, due to the characteristics of the site, it is required to go through a conservation subdivision design, um, which ostensibly requires at least 50% of the lot to be maintained as open space. But accordingly, lots are allowed to be uh, smaller uh, than uh, might normally be required in the RF. 
um, allows for less roadway to potentially be built and, and those sorts of things. Um, so as staff reviewed the, the sketch plan, um, really the principal issues that we flagged were really around um, ensuring as we go through this process that we're understanding sort of how this property fits into the context of the neighborhood, so to speak. You know, there are some, uh, there's a, at least one parcel that's a budding open space that was part of a an abutting or adjoining conservation subdivision, so maybe there's opportunity there to create more of a, a preserved area. Um, and then also looking at are there opportunities to enable future right-of-way connections. Is, you know, is this a, a property that that might make sense to enable uh, those type of connections or are the characteristics such that maybe they don't? Um, and again, I think just zooming out a little bit would help understand that. Then I guess the other sort of main element that we raised in our comments just had to do with um, the wetlands delineation study and uh, this board has been uh, taking a look at occasionally doing um, uh, peer reviews of wetland delineations and is this a site that we'd want to see that occur. Um, and I guess just in terms of that, the one thing that staff noted was they, they have had someone go out, uh, Mark Hampton, do a wetlands delineation on site <coughs> just in December um, and there seemed to be a few ponds identified on the site and, and um, we think it would be important for a vernal, a vernal pool study to be done um, in the next month or two when, when the timing's right, which is about April, um, to be part of that analysis. So with that, I would turn it back to you, Mr. Chair. Thanks, Jay. And I'll turn it over to the applicant. Thank you very much. Uh, good evening, uh, board, uh, Jay. Um, I, I appreciate the, the overview from Jay. It's very thorough, very in-depth. Um, I've got uh, the original design to show that we could do nine lots. One of the lots uh, actually will have an existing house on it that was already there, built in the 30s. Mm -hmm. um, that being said, I'll quickly go into the cluster design. I, I really wasn't intending on doing the presentation tonight. Uh, my engineer is sitting at the Saco Town Hall uh, for conflicting meetings. Um, uh, the planner was kind enough to send me notes from uh, the staff review and uh, I'd like to just kind of quickly go over some of the notes and, and the responses <coughs> to them. <coughs> uh, the first one was understanding about uh, connectivity to open space. Um, we have, based on the ordinances, having to have uh, contiguous open space. We have it set up that open space wraps around all the entire lots and the connecting subdivision, which would be a butt here, uh, I think it was called Bittersweet, uh, their open space would abut our open space. Um, uh, didn't happen intentionally, kind of happened unintentionally, but it, it seems to work. Um, the second topic was uh, making sure that there could be potential right of way uh, to a future subdivision uh, on any side. Uh, Bittersweet, of course, is already developed, and that would be to the left. There is the Johnston property all the way out back. I have not reached out to him nor an abutting property back into the left. Uh, it's about a 25, 30-acre parcel. The Johnston has about 140 acres. But we will reach out to them to see if there's any potential future need for their point of view and then take it accordingly. Um, the a uh, couple of notes about uh, fire department. Uh, I was actually able to reach out to them today about a fire tank <coughs> and already get a response back. Um, so I know exactly where they're going to want it and approximately how it's going to be designed. Um, I'm working with the city for the police department to confirm a street name, a subdivision name that will uh, work with the city. Um, there was a note about the uh, making sure that we have proper design for the hammerhead and I'm going to refer back that probably in a month or two when uh, my engineer can present that. Um, there was a note about uh, stormwater and uh, you know, future ownership and again that's also underway. Um, the road uh, doesn't extend further than the maximum road length of the city. Um, the lot sizes are between 30 and 60,000 square feet. We've kept space available to uh, enjoy open space. There are some natural trails that were there. They've been there for many, many years. And I'll, I'll point them out here. Where there's a natural trail system that actually wraps around most of the uh, lot in the open space already. 
And so we tried to really focus on trying to keep that in its natural state, um, as well as having you know the, the lots available. Um, that's about all I have. Okay, thank you. Um, Rachel, do you have anything? Um, I, well, Jay answered one of the questions that I had about the pond, but I'm I'm intrigued by the um, the existing trails, and I notice uh, that there's one that kind of ends in an open space. And was there any thought about connecting it to the proposed roadway so it actually circled all the way around? Not following you, but um, well, yeah, that trail right right that there. You, right. Was there any thought of connecting? Uh, Right, because if you notice, it circles. I assume that the N N E T T easement is also a trail, a woods road. So, so this is actually all open space. So, and we don't have a formalized trail, but we could design. We could cut in for a small trail system to tie into the existing one. And then, if you notice, it, it goes, and and at least yeah. it, it could come out at that uh, that extension at the end, that in between lot five and six. Is that an open? Uh, lot five, five and six. Yep, that's an open space to access the link out back. So all right. if somebody wanted to go out. This is this is all open space. Back. <coughs> so okay. This is designed so if somebody doesn't want to necessarily walk behind their lot and tie into the open mm -hmm. space, they can just walk up the road. Okay. I believe we have left 25 feet for them to tie in. Um, right. I, walk good. I, I appreciate that. And, I, and I, as I was looking at it, I <coughs> simply saw a potential opportunity to make that a circle. That's I see. Uh, what one proposal we're looking at for a subdivision name, and the reason uh, I'm, I'm going here is that there's a very majestic, it's either a silver birch tree or a um, yellow birch tree, and it sits just past this trail system. Mm -hmm. And if anyone's interested in a site walk, it, it will, it, 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 it's so majestic in its design and the fact that it's been opened up around um, so that it just sits all by itself. Um, my focus is to name it, uh, and again, I don't know if it's a, a yellow birch or silver birch, uh, but that uh, will be the subdivision name uh, if it's permitted by the city. Um, so we're focusing on that in the open space. Thank you. All right, thanks. Nick? Sure, thank you. Um, I just want to clarify something real quick. So. One of the questions is whether or not this is an area we'd want to require a peer review. And, and I, I think I saw two, one of the reasons was because of the time the wetlands are being delineated, mm -hmm. which is winter, a little harder to define, I imagine. Um, is that part of the reasoning behind that, that request? Well, I think part of that and also in, there's, um, as you see in the wetlands delineation, there's these areas that are identified sort of as ponds. And so as we look at that, we sort of say, what, what, what does that mean exactly? And I think the other issue really uh, revolves around the vernal pool analysis and being sure that that's um, done in it, because that, that really does need to be done in a certain time frame, April, May, it all depends on sort of when weather changes. Um, but um, So I think that's really the main focus. Had, have you, had, is that something you've given thought to, which is conducting a further review in April and May? Um, we knew when I had Mark out there, uh, it was actually beautiful come early December when Mark went out, there wasn't you know, an inch of snow on the ground. So it was easy to do the wetlands delineation. He did lead me to believe that there's a pretty reasonable chance we'll be looking for a, a vernal pool study, which of course he wouldn't be able to do until the, the, the okay. time period allowed. Okay, so it appears we're relatively on the same page on that. Yeah, yeah. Not, not surprising if it's gonna be asked for. Okay, uh, and then I think that's it, except for I had one, um, one clarifying question here. Was the idea to have this proposed roadway, and I believe you said the other, the other potential development spaces to the rear, of, to the right, uh, which is, looks like north here? Yeah, if, if you can kind of picture this, the homes are here. There's about 140 acres sitting at the Johnson property. Okay. There was, honestly, there was no thought given to connecting to any other project. Um, that wasn't until we got staff. Um, no. Okay. Uh, but there is there is a gentleman who is off of Mitchellville Road. He's got 35 acres, and then the Johnson property's got 140 acres. Right here is Bittersweet. It's already established. Uh, 
uh, their open space abuts our open space, so there's going to be no no point of trying to connect to them. <coughs> and so, I imagine what the 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 request that would be some thought given to maybe bending the road a little and squishing lot five around, so there could be a, a easement or a path. Is that the idea? The, the yeah. road the road was specifically designed to minimize the impact of wetlands. We we hooked it over here to really minimize this is the only wetland we're going to cross and we tried to do it in such a way that it minimized it instead of going straight in. Um, so there was a lot of design to make sure that we didn't touch the wetlands and make sure we kept the open space all contiguous. Um, but originally there was no intent or no thought put into tying into a future uh, piece. In, if I might, this is sort of one of those you know, areas of dichotomy between the, what the ordinance seeks. Again, the conservation subdivision design is really aimed at minimizing impact as, as was just stated on wetlands and to preserve sort of the, the greatest amount of open space possible um, and to sort of put those pieces together where, where feasible um, so you're creating larger swaths of natural area. Um, the sort of the juxtaposition of that is the subdivision ordinance where it seeks to create interconnected roadways where feasible, you know, where, where it makes sense so that it, you know, more efficiency in terms <laughs> of services, emergency access, and those sorts of things. Um, and so as staff was drafting these questions, it wasn't so much a, you know, we think this needs to be done. This is really one of those ones where it's, you know, might be helpful just to zoom out a little bit and understand what that connectivity is. Because I think as, as Mr. Chamberlain already noted, there's a, a bunch of open space um, established as part of a prior conservation subdivision off of Mitchell Hill Road um, that, that sort of connects to the southern end of this property. And so, you know, there, there may not be opportunities to create these right away. But again, I think just really zooming out just a bit, seeing what those properties look like, trying to understand, understanding that, you know, Mr. Chamberlain doesn't have the ability to go on other people's property to, you know, fully vet what's out there. But if we can look at general contours, sort of state, <coughs> excuse me, state level wetlands, and get a sense of what, what's in the area, and maybe this is the exact appropriate design, and it, an interconnection doesn't make sense. So I, um, I will say that this abutting property would probably not be feasible because the wetland starts on my property and then expands on it. So we would have to go through wetlands to tie into his existing 35 acres. The Johnson property, uh, be more than happy to reach out to that family and uh, if they're willing to talk. Um, I know it's been in the family a long time. It's not been developed for a long time and I can't imagine it's going to be developed anytime soon, but happy to reach out to them. So, and. and and I, don't misunderstand me. I think I just wanted to understand better what it is that could possibly be done. The way I look at it is if we have an opportunity to actually piece together large tracts of open space, and I think that's, that's a positive as well. So uh, don't misunderstand me in asking to build a roadway to somebody else's property. It's not what I'm getting at. Um, I just wanted to know if that was what the, the line of thinking from uh, staff was, something could possibly be done down the line. There's also the other thing, which is when you go to market these and sell these, uh, some of these people are probably believing they're going to end up on a dead end road, which is, of course, a more valuable asset to a lot of people. So, but, you know, without being very clear about interconnectivity down the line somewhere, it's, I don't think it's uh, necessarily uh, very fair to you or any future owners of that property um, based on what we're looking at. So, um, that's it. That's what I got for now. Thank you. Thanks. Roger? Um. <coughs> Is, is this primarily a wooded lot? It's a beautifully wooded lot. Okay. And the trails, are they um, more or less like, um, um, you know, timber or hot? You know? the, the gentleman I'm buying this from is third or fourth generation. Uh, they used to own a sawmill, and actually I think they've even cut material right on site and built some of these structures that are there. What's there is a lot of tall hemlock, a lot of tall pine, a little bit of hardwood, but it's just absolutely stunningly beautiful land. Um, I, I actually have a question for you, Jay, on um, on the open space. Uh, I'm, look, I'm looking at this map here, mm -hmm. and um, I notice on the on the south side of um, Holmes Road, there's a lot of connectivity mm -hmm. with all those homes there, but on the north side, 
with the open space. Is, are there any provisions where if you had abutting open spaces, does that prohibit any future road connectivity? Um, so I would say with the open space that is associated with bittersweet, where I think that speaks to what uh, Mr. McGee was just talking about, about expectations for future connections, where that open space has been established and it's stated purpose is in a conservation easement that you really couldn't put a roadway through that. Yeah. Um, and so that's where, um, you know, it's a, that's part of the board's job sort of at this stage of the process is to sort of look, are there those areas that make sense to at least continue a right of way, if not actually build the road at this time, at least leave the right of way there for future possible connection. Um, and if there isn't, then sort of uh, as de you know, as depicted here, sort of closing off that hammerhead with lot private property all around it. Well, maybe that in you know in this you know site context makes sense. Okay, and in, in this um, this project right here, then mm -hmm. does the town have a preference whether they want to go with a conventional plan? As versus the cluster? It's a required. Um, be, so the, oh, ordi to, the ordinance the requires cluster. when you have more than, uh, there's a couple of provisions, but in this one, it's if you have greater than an acre of wetlands, then you have to do a conservation okay. subdivision okay. design. So, um, but you have just over three. Yep. So okay. there's no, no choice in the matter. Okay. All right. Yep. Okay. I'm all set. Thanks. Susan? Thank you. Um, first of all, um, just to say that you obviously know we're going to be watching for the um, wells and the septic systems very carefully. We do anyway, but this particular, um, I'm sure you've already met our engineer. Um, because it's in an aquifer protection overlay district, yes. you have to put that out there because it doesn't happen every day. Mm -hmm. We are dealing with a development on and on and um, protection, a lot of, get an aquifer overlay protection area. Um, I want to live here. This is gorgeous. I, I would, if, if the board's not going to do a site walk. Oh, I think we should do a site you walk. You should. That's on my list. I would love I to have I really you think there. we should do a site walk on yeah. this one. Um, question about what is labeled Woods Road. That is not the same thing as the trails. There are pieces that say Woods Road all around the place here. Those are not really trails. Uh, I don't have Woods You don't road. have them on yours? I'm looking mine we have very clear paths. Right. Uh, but I, I know but I wanna know what the it's what running. Yeah, I, I think those are probably skitter probably skitter trails would be my assumption. That's typically okay. what, what's seen. Is that I mean I'm right? not sure why they're on here if it's not something that we need to be no he, don't worry about my it. My engineer could explain it better if he was here. Okay. I'd like to suggest that I think I know what Woods Roads are, and I think that our um, assistant town planner just explained it, and we want to make sure they are gone off these okay. um, drawings. They're confusing. Um, yes, it's wonderful. All these trails are great. I can't wait to, to see them. Um, yes, I think the Vernal Pools, um, another wetland delineation around vernal pools is very important. The road design is going to be important, especially where you're going to be covering, where you're going to be crossing the wetlands in terms of how much fill there's going to be. We just watch that all very carefully. And I'm not sure the ponds, never mind, I'm going to wait until you come back. I'll wait until you come back, because you're going to come back with a yeah. more delineation. I, I, I will, just to touch base on uh, where the road's going to go in relation to the wetlands. There's actually a beaten down path that the current owner has put in culvert, and we specifically tried to work to incorporate that to uh -huh. minimize the wetlands. Okay. Okay, good. Um, is this going to, the open space will be owned by a, a um, homeowner, homeowners? Homeowners Association, yes. Right. Is if, again, if it's as lovely as you say it is, it might be really wonderful to put in a small parking lot. Uh, down at the area that um, Rebecca was, for, I mean, uh, Rachel for trail was access. Mm -hmm. for trail access. Mm -hmm. As Rachel was pointing out, down near uh, lot two, I don't know what that wetland looks like. It might be much too wet to do something like that. But just an opportunity. Um, of course, you could do it up at the Hammerhead as well. Well, you probably couldn't do it there. <coughs> just a thought. Okay. Thank I don't you. want to go into it tonight, but just a thought as an opportunity. <coughs> if, it's, if it's as nice as I know it's going to be to have a small parking for non-paved. 
for people who want to take a hike. I think it would be lovely. Yes, I'm looking forward to seeing this again, and I don't have any further questions. Thanks. Thank you. Uh, yeah. I, I, if I can ask the sure. board, uh, can I come back up for preliminary before a wetlands delineation if uh, the my engineer can get everything done in time? And, and again, we know it's, the, 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 I'm sorry, the um, vernal pool. I think the, if I might, I think the vernal pool study will be sort of an integral part of a preliminary plan because that will identify if there are any required setbacks okay. and if Point. lots are being located where they okay. should be or shouldn't be. So okay. I think that yeah. that is going to be a key component of that preliminary Excellent. submission. Thank yeah. you. I think that becomes kind of a threshold type yep. item for this type of development. But okay. we're getting there. Awesome. We'll be here before you know. It. Um, so I think we've covered things pretty well here. I do appreciate uh, it's always helpful at this stage to get the kind of the point by point, you know, succinct responses to to the staff comments and kind of where you are on those things. So that's really helpful. Um, we look forward to seeing how that vernal pool study comes out. Um, the uh, I think there's a discussion on open space these are the connectivity and as Jay points out that's a little bit of a, you know, that, that's one of the spots in the ordinance where there's sort of a, not necessarily conflicting, but um, it could go either way. can sort of go either way. And um, I think I would tend to agree with those who say, could say that while it's certainly worth exploring and, and we appreciate any efforts to continue to, you know, do that due diligence, that in the end it, it may be. Um, it may be better to end up with sort of you know larger swaths of, of unbroken open space, which is a, a pretty rare thing um, these days. So um, we'll see how that all plays out. Um, Ms. August made a good point about the aquifer protection overlay, and that that is something we definitely need to have on on the radar. Um, road design we touched on um, potential trail parking, and we do encounter that sometimes when when there is such an attractive site. And we understand there's a sort of a balancing act there. You don't want to make it, you know, too attractive, so to speak, to the point where it becomes a, an issue. But um, if it's a resource that's there, mm -hmm. it might be nice if it's feasible to to have have some kind of infrastructure there. Um, and uh, yeah, I mean, I'd, I'd be all for a site walk whenever that's feasible, um, provided that it, you know, meshes with your with your timing, um, and I think if we're we're looking at getting into April or May with the vernal pool study anyway, mm -hmm. then then maybe that dovetails pretty well, and we can put our boots on and walk around out there. So I, I, I would be excited to have you out there. Okay, um, I think that pretty well covers everything. Is there anything that you need from us at this no, point this beyond great, that? No, very informative. I appreciate it. Um, thank you for working with me, not being an engineer, not uh, having my gentleman here. So, all right. Thank you. You did, you did fine. Thank you. <laughs> Item number five on the agenda. Commercial Place LLC requests a sketch plan review for Enterprise Drive, Assessor's Map U39, Lot 47-1 through 16. 36. Jay? Yep. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, I think most board members will recall this item was before the board in the fall, I believe it was October, as part of the, the first step in the plan development review process, which is the site inventory and analysis phase. The next phase in the development process, the plan development review process, is a master plan review process. However, the applicant sort of asked and working with staff um, to come back to the board to really have a discussion principally around the question of sort of density or understanding the commercial to residential ratio um, that would be allowable to be built out. Um, and I'll touch on that in a little bit. Um, just sort of background for the property. This is an approved commercial subdivision back in 2003, Enterprise Business Park, which has been built out, maybe about uh, a third to a quarter of the lots have been built out, something to that effect. Um, since the original uh, subdivision approval, which allowed the original zoning when it was approved, really only allowed commercial development. <coughs> Since then, and just within the last year or two, the Highest Parkway Zoning District, which this is in, was updated 
and now allows for a mix of use, uh, mixed use development. It allows for <coughs> residential to be mixed in with commercial, provided that the residential development is no more than 40% of the overall floor area of the development. So with that, part of the, the, the job of the board and the applicant is going to be to figure out what's what going to be mean? developed here. Um, so, so to that end, um, there's about 15 lots that remain undeveloped. And so the idea is for the board, again, and applicant to work together to try to extrapolate sort of a build-out scenario for the remaining commercial lots. And how that will then relate to the amount of residential that's allowed to be developed. So to that end, the applicant has provided the board with a matrix of the existing nine commercial lots that have been built out and what the sort of sizes are and the overall average, which is roughly around, I can't remember, maybe around 15,000 square feet of build out on those nine lots. And then they're, again, making some assumptions around, the, which is all you can do, around the remaining undeveloped commercial lots about how much development could occur on those. Um, and there, the assumption there is about 30,000 square feet of development per lot. Um, so this is really the board's first time dealing with this new updated zoning and having to work towards these unknowns. Um, so it's important that both the board and applicant understand you know, that the zoning only <coughs> allows for 40% of the floor area to be built out as residential. So whatever the build out scenario is, there's going to be, have to be a mechanism in place that ensures that the commercial development and the residential development occur in that ratio. So again, it's really, you know, part of this discussion is how are we making the assumptions about the build out of these undeveloped lots? You know, are we using the right assumptions? Is this the likely scenario that we should expect to see? Um, so. Um, I think that is sort of the critical element of our discussion. There's a few other points in the applicant's submission, but I think for now um, I'll sort of let those comments stand and, and be happy to answer other questions as we go forward, but hopefully it set the stage somewhat for you. Okay, thanks, and I'll hand it over to the applicant's representative. Uh, good evening, members of the board and Jay. Uh, my name is Jason Vafiatis, and I am with Atlantic Resource Consultants. And uh, Jay, I just, just summed up pretty succinctly what I've been struggling with for about a month and a half, so uh, he should be getting paid to do <laughs> what I do. Um, yeah, so the primary reason we're here tonight uh, is, as Jay said, to sort of opine and wrestle a little bit with, you know, with how do we sort of, we're trying to solve an equation with two variables, but we only have one equation that we don't have, um, you know, to hit the 60-40 scenario that's in the zoning, we, we have a lot of lots left that are unbuilt, and so how do we get to that number? And then, as he said, how do we sort of ensure that things kind of stay in place? Um, you recall from the site analysis back in 2016, <coughs> that item was left open for discussion, and there was a number in that site analysis, which I believe, Jay, correct me if I'm wrong, was like 27,500 square feet per per lot, including the developed and undeveloped lots that were to remain commercial. Um, I thought that number was a little aggressive, and so when we went to the master plan sort of planning, so to speak, of uh, providing a, a, a layout, what I've actually done here, and I apologize you don't have this because this came from uh, Jay's comment response to the application, is to put these lots in uh, I basically did a sketch plan for each lot saying, okay, what would be the maximum build out that you could feasibly get on those lots? And in the next submission and with staff, we'll go through, we have a chance to review this. But so those numbers you have in the matrix are actually what you're seeing on this plan. The green ones would be two story, or in some cases they're one and a half story. So there's half of top floor. And then the, uh, the yellow ones are just single story. And uh, that's primarily, I think, one of the things that we wanted you to look at. Um, and then the other things were, there's some other attachments for 
traffic data that we picked up and, and just the general layout if the, uh, the board had an opinion about how we laid out the rest of the subdivision. So with that, I'll turn it over to the board and see if they have comments, questions. Okay. Who wants to take the first whack at this decision? Question. <coughs> I don't have any, any offer, <laughs> anything to offer at all. Um, questions. What you have up there differs from what I have in the green. The green has been added. Yes. Right. So I go back to what I'm looking at, which is pink. Which is what you're looking at is Right. So I'll hold this up here until we flip back. To please do. So that indicates a multi multi unit buildings. Yes. Residential. Correct. And the gray around it is parking, et cetera. Yes. And that's actually that's the code. That that layout right. would, would bear out. Yep. So where is <coughs> the so we're not going to have any commercial at all? I think that's where the other plan, so this subdivision, when it was approved. No, I understand what it is we need no. to do. I just yes. don't know where it's going to be. Yes, so, so I understand. So Susan's saying you're, you're perhaps envisioning something that was commercial first floor, residential second and third floor, or even, even a mix within the mix it, itself. Is, I would, is that I'm, I'm envisioning some kind of a mix within this piece of property. Yes. And I don't know how that how that would I mean where would you put it? So the whole so the application sort of assumes that this whole the whole thing you see here so there's all the trails there's the existing enterprise business park this was the old phase three and this goes back I think before any of us it were, comes were down here. And includes the blue lines but the green lines below yes and those are those are the tr existing trail systems and the, one, the land that is now white but surrounded by green is where the industrial slash commercial will go so we're, yeah, separ so, so we're separating out the residential from the commercial on the, on the same Within the lot. same subdivision, in the same within lot, the overall same parent property, correct, there are going to be, it's going to be three okay. phases of commercial development essentially, uh, two of which are largely built out. So no, I, get, I get that. Okay. I'm, I'm, I'm on a roll here. Let, yeah. me, let me continue because I'm going to lose my train of thought. Okay, flip it over for me if you would please. Yep. So with this one, we now have additional <coughs> residential because that's what the green is. Oh, oh, no, sorry. No. All right. The, the green is commercial. The green so the only residential is okay. still what you're looking at is the, is the orange. Okay. And down below where the green is, the, below the um, wetland area, okay, the yeah. green below, those are, are also going to be commercial. Yes, and right. don't commercial. Are we predicting? Other commercial can go in there. I mean, is there space and room and the, the land to, to accept more? So this, what you're looking at here, would be 100% lots completely built out, final. I don't see. I can't see yellow from here. Yeah. So right. So the the, the yellow ones are. The, yeah. This is the the risk we run when we the bring yellow up down. The there's yellow down below yep. too, but next Th to the green. That's unbuilt commercial. Yeah. Okay. Yes, I know that. That I can actually see, but down below. Okay, so the trick is that what is now pink and is going to be residential yes. is going to be 40% of this entire lot, this entire subdivision. Yes. And we need to make sure that... <laughs> we need to make sure. Like we can make sure of anything in this scenario. The goal is to have it be 40% and the rest of it's going to be 60%, but we can't guarantee that because we don't know who's going to come in. Exactly. Give me a clue how we're going to do that. Well, and that's... <laughs> Here's a word that bothers me, extrapolate. Yes. I don't think that this board, and correct me if I'm wrong, I've been around a long time, but I've never heard the board use the word extrapolate. We deal with, we deal with pieces of lines on a drawing that say this is exactly how many square feet and this is exactly how much and then we make a decision. We don't extrapolate. So I'm right. totally confused as to what we can do about that, Mr. <laughs> yeah, so this is a this is a new bit of zoning. Um, and so that's where again, you know, there's there's two pieces to this and that's why you know, staff has identified that coming up with the future build out scenario that's reasonable is critical. There's going to be other checks 
down the road to be sure that the commercial development and residential development ratio occurs. But um, at this stage, the best we can do is say, what is the likely development scenario? And it may be well that, you know, again, where this is new, I, I guess it's, it's hard to, um, you know, I was talking with Dan Bacon um, <coughs> earlier today. There's, there is going to be additional sort of legal analysis <coughs> and administrative, you know, sort of phasing to this type of development to sort of put checks and balances in. Since that says, if we assume the undeveloped lots are building out at 30,000, let's just you know, that's what the, 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 the applicant suggested. If, if that's the assumption we're making, you know, we'll have to say, well, you know, only so much residential can occur before X amount of commercial occurs. Okay. Something to that effect. Okay, let me interrupt because that's exactly where I want you to go, that I want you to go with you. It's like, I don't, there's a difference between making, a, a, a allowing a subdivision and phasing the subdivision. Mm -hmm which is essentially what we'd be doing here, but it would have to be worded very differently. In other words, X number of units, X number of feet after we get or as we get or bef uh, up to, and then there has to be commercial before we can go to the next phase of residential. And quite frankly, I don't care how that gets worked out because it's not my job, but I want to make sure I understand that that is how it, we're going into it saying that that's how it's going to work as opposed to here are all your residential, <coughs> build it out, and bring in the, res the commercial when you can. No. Yes. No. Uh, I think so part of, right, so there, there, there are these other components that need to happen, but, and I think, you know, that's getting a little bit ahead of ourselves. I think the first thing that we need to do is understand is <coughs> the build out scenario that they're suggesting 30,000 square feet on average for the remaining undeveloped commercial lots is that a reasonable expectation. How do we, we know? W well, I think that's the critical information that's been provided is we know that the development to date on the lots, the nine lots have been built out, average about 15,000 square feet per building. The assumption in 2003 with the DOT um, traffic study was around 12 to 15,000 square foot of building per lot. So that's what's been built. So those, those are the, <coughs> so the assumption back in 03 was around 15,000. What's been built is around 15,000. And what staff put in our comments was, if we're gonna make the jump to 30,000, what's the rationale so other? If I may, the, yep. the crux of it, just looking at how the, uh, I'm maybe stating the obvious, but yep. looking at how that math works is that the more ambitious they are with their commercial projection, the more housing they can Absolutely. propose now. Correct. So, I mean, and there's a separate discussion that we were getting into about enforcement mechanisms and how well, you... I don't want to go into the enforcement how you, mechanism How you monitor either. that going forward. I'm just but concerned that about the 15,000 which is being built out and the 30,000 which is being projected by the applicants is what they can base their residential on and that that is a form of mathematics that I've flunked in high school. I don't understand how we can say, what are they basing it on? Where do they get the 30,000 from? I don't understand where that and comes from. If I may, uh, I, don't, I don't think we've heard that from, from yeah. the applicant. Yeah. And, it, it, and I'll generally agree that this is, this is the max that you would, that you would ever see. And, and it actually, it leaves room so at this calculation, it leaves about 10 or 12 percent more available floor area than what we're what we're proposing. So, you know, so so I think to take a more realistic approach, you know, it's, it's going to be one of these iterative processes that we're working with town staff to say, you know, what what sort of backing proof can can you know the uh, the developer and 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 us kind of provide to work in concert with the town. But I, I hear you, Susan. You know, it's it's. It's one of these. It was a it was a subdivision that was the zoning changed after it was approved, and so you can do something different in it. But that something different, the zoning was anticipating you're starting new. So it's kind of a we're forcing into a new zoning with the subdivision. I give up. I, mean, I don't I don't get how we're going to get into this, but those were my concerns. I don't know how to get into this. 
Roger. Uh, <clears throat> question for Jay. Uh, is this is this going to be going before the town council at all, or is this decision nope. strictly I was raised? This is a planning board review. It's not okay. a contract zone. It's planning board review and. Okay. Yeah. Um, is it? Has there been any discussion about the phasing of the multifamily units? How, how you know how long that's going to take? Yes, and, and certainly I don't think that you would see this all built at once. And so, I just kind of throwing this out there, but I can envision a scenario where you say, okay, you get phase one, which is one third of what you're doing, or somehow tied to maybe the existing components that are there, and say, you know, and, and sort of build in the phasing uh, a little bit beyond that. Um, so there's certainly, we're still sort of back in our camp. We're sort of wrestling around with, you know, how is that build out going to be? And there's a couple of um, very interested parties that are that are looking to team up and develop this. And so we're just trying to get ahead of what obviously is going to be a very confusing issue. Um, and that's why we came in as a sketch plan to just kind of Based get on the ball what rolling. the uh, commercial build out is right now, how many multifamily buildings could you, did you look at that at all? Right I, I did, yeah, and, and depending on what you do with the buildings, you know, you, you could probably get two or three. Two or three? There, you know, some 80, 85 okay. units. Um, what, I, I guess another question, Jay, is what happens if we, now I'm looking at, at this sheet here, and it says here the, um, the lots reserved for um, commercial development, it's 23,000, not 30. Is that so that's not that not relevant anymore. No, that that is relevant. You're right. It's, it's um, the twenty four thousand is that's the average of all how many commercial of all um, I'm sorry twenty four commercial lots. The, the basically the the fifteen thousand average that's been built to date right. and the thirty thousand okay. average assumption of the fifteen that have been unbuilt. You, you you put that all together. That's where the twenty three nine thirty comes from. 24,000. Okay, the next question then is, uh, what, what if we went with this assumption, 24,000 on average, and they, at the end of the, um, all the build out, it's only averaging 18,000. What, hap what, what's, uh, what happens then? That's, that's sort of the question we were talking about. That's, that's, the, next, that's the next step. I think right now um, we don't have answers to that. I think there, there will need to be additional legal review and analysis done as this goes through the process. What we're really asking the board right now is, does making the assumption of essentially an average of 30,000 square feet per undeveloped lot to date, is that a reasonable assumption to make? Right. And again, if the board doesn't feel like you have the information, you know, this, is, this is not an easy discussion to have because it is conjecture. Um, but um, that's, I mean, the, if, if I might just to sort of put it simply, Thanks. as staff looked at this, you know, I think that the two key pieces of evidence the board has that are known is the DOT permit or the permitting that happened in 2003, which assumed about roughly 15,000 square foot per lot, and what's been built, roughly 15,000 square foot per lot. So there was an assumption back in 03, and there's been development since 03 that both seem to equal each other. Now what the applicant is asking the board to do is to make the leap to, say, 30,000 square feet per lot. Staff's not suggesting that's an impossible leap to make, <laughs> but we just want to understand what, what's the evidence being provided. And to date, what was provided, you know, we, you know there's, there's boxes on a plan, if that's enough for the board. And you know, staff acts at the direction of the board, um, but there might be additional analysis that needs to be done to help the board get there. And, and I will add, we're not asking you to make any decisions tonight. We're just, we're, if we could get your opinions and, and suggestions, we would take that. We'd work with staff to sort of, um, you know, I guess my argument, or not really an argument, but physically you can do it. Um, and uh, the DOT, per, you know, I, I'm well versed in that permit that Jay's talking about. And um, I will note that some of the, uh, predominantly a lot of the stuff that has been done, with the exception of this lot here, um, the, uh, the, the the old contact lot, there are some of the smaller lots that have been done. So if if you took, say, you took a ratio of the existing, I'm just throwing this out there, the existing 
develop the area of lots per building envelope and then apply that ratio to the unbuilt ones might be a way of coming up with a, at least there's data uh, to measure that out and that's one thing that we looked at. Well, that's what I was going to ask next is if you've done any analysis of the, the uh, buildable, the floor area of the existing lots compared to the area of those lots and compare that to what's still available. Yeah, I, I, I have done that number. number yep. that, yep. I've, I've analyzed this thing more times than I want to. But <laughs> yeah, it's a. Uh, so it's do you uh, think? Do you think it's thirty? For the future, the the undeveloped uh, commercial. You think it could be thirty, or is or is that a stretch? You know, I I you can do as an engineer. I can I can sit in front of you today and say, those numbers can be. It's, it's permanent through the DEP this way, and that's why I included the traffic data. The traffic data, um, we, we would have to augment the traffic movement permit, pay some fees uh, as part of that. Um, but that this design here can be done engineering-wise. Yes. Now, I can't answer questions on what the market would put. Sure, yeah. You know, we've even talked about we kicked around ideas. You know, do you deed restrict minimum building sizes and development sizes to the lots? Uh, as part of this to say that might be a legal mechanism to sort of bear trap the number at this point. I mean, there's a, there's a whole number of, of things that I think we're looking at, but certainly your feedback is, is appreciated because that's kind of, it's kind of sets where we're starting from. And yeah. <coughs> I mean, it is an interesting dilemma because we're kind of working backwards here in a way. So um, this is not a, a full build out of the commercial, so we can't say, okay, you can do this and it fits, fits in there nice. Um, I was pleased, I was kind of curious with the, with the original uh, plans we have. I was wondering whether you were just abandoning the other access road going out to Route 1, but it looks like on yours that's going to be commercial development. Yes, yeah, yeah. No, it's oh, okay. fully, fully intended everything that was approved yeah. to remain. What we did do, not to change the conversation, we did provide access based on the site analysis meeting that we had. There used to be a connection to uh, Three Diamonds Realty property up here, which is predominantly wetlands, and like we talked about in the last project. You'd never see a connection there. However, there are uplands to the Scarborough Downs property uh, at the end of the parcel, if you go all the way to the end of the map there. Um, and we did envision building out to provide a connection there. And, you know, there's some benefit to actually making that connection uh, sooner than later, if that could ever work out with the Scarborough Downs owners, um, because that kind of alleviates a lot of other engineering issues. But we're not going to we're not going to go down that rabbit hole tonight. We're just you know. Well, I guess um, I don't know. Uh, I I I think if you can come up with some comp you know some extrapolation with the um, you know with what what's there now and what may occur. Because I think 30 seems to me like it's 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 over optimistic, you know. But 30 is the answer to can you do it? Yeah, yeah. And then I say yes, and then right, exactly. So there's a, there's some other things where you know Jay and I will get involved with, you know, okay, well then what's feasible versus what's reasonable. I mean, Jay, just uh, say say they got to um, almost. 80% build out on the commercial, and they were nowhere near what, what they're going to satisfy. Mm -hmm. what, what would they do? Go before the zoning board and get. get it? Again, I, you know, <laughs> I, this is our first project looking at this mm -hmm. type of zoning. So, what those checks and balances are going to be, how we ensure that 60 <coughs> 40 ratio, I think that's where we are going to need the town attorney, you know, some legal analysis and, and you know. A, a host of belts and suspenders put in place as this goes forward. So, um, um, yeah, I, I don't have the yeah. I don't have those answers. I think you know the sort of notion you put forth about doing a proportional floor yeah. area yeah. Yeah. floor area. That's sort of the type of analysis that ha I had been thinking about as well. Um, you know, that might make some sense as really w what's what's you know what's the market sort of what the market demand been, at least right. we'll know that, and, and then maybe there you know, can be some other assumptions made based off that. But. I used up all my time. <laughs> <laughs> Nick? All right, so there are nine lots, correct, that are developed? Yes. Yeah. So of those lots, only one 
of those lots that's currently developed is greater than 20,000, not even 30, greater than right. 20,000. So uh, one of the nine. <coughs> three of them that don't even make 10,000. So uh, I think the answer is probably based on a percentage of what, what's being thrown around. And I think it, if you look at your 40,000-ish uh, total size and square feet, and you look at the size of the current buildings that are in place, it's about 20%. So if that tends to be the average of what you're showing for a build-out of, say, 20%, I think that's the calculation. Yeah. You would have a better time convincing me that's a better calculation than saying this is what can be done yeah. can we do it. And, um, it. and I will add, so it's floor area, not footprint. So if you built a two-story structure, obviously you get, the, you know, and, and so then we got to look at, you know, if you look at developments of this kind, this one, and then others to get sort of a, a larger pool of data, how many of those structures are going to be two stories? Then you get into the, you can't really go three stories because you've got, you know, the, the part, uh, without confusing you, you know, the parking matrix changes because it changes with use. If you have a, a industrial facility where it's a, a warehouse or a manufacturing facility, you need much less parking than if you have a professional office. So, you know, say we could land a, a big fish or that Mr. Miley could land a big fish, you know, it could completely change the numbers. You just, right, we don't know that. So we're, we got to come up with, as you say, a reasonable sort of calculation. I, uh, I suspect that you have a starting point of data with your current build out. And I suspect as a person in the audience who would be glad to help you with a commercial development area <laughs> that you could use to analyze yep. whether or not the percentages are actually matching what you're seeing for development in Scarborough yep. Yep. Um, with, with these types of allowed uses in the Highgates Parkway area. I'm sure there's something out there. So yep. I think Karen would be a good person to talk to. Karen, correct? Mm -hmm. yep. Start for me. All right. Um, I think that's the way to go. I, I really oh, I, um, I think, I think that's throwing a, a hard number of 30,000 is asking a lot of this board. Yeah. That's my opinion. All right. Thanks, Nick. Rachel? Yeah, um, a couple of things. One one very minor, and that is uh, that Jay can answer. The, the clubhouse, is that counted as the residential? Um, good question. I guess I haven't no dove that deep into oh, yeah. worrying about parsing it that far at this point. Yeah. Um, well, I just looked at the square footage involved in yeah. it, and I, I, don't, I doubt that it makes a difference, but it was a, a question. Yeah. Uh, I, I guess part of my concern is how long it would take us to find out if we were right in terms <coughs> of, of guessing that the building of the commercial area was going to end up being the 60% versus the, the residential. Yeah. How long has it been since one of the uh, commercial lots was sold? That's a very good question, and I'm, I'm embarrassed to say I don't know that answer. Um, I can certainly get that. Um, I do know, I don't know the extent at which where the negotiations are, but there there may be one selling soon. Um, and uh, uh, Jay and I have had a private conversation about that. I don't know what the extent of where that's heading, but that would actually be a good piece of information if we, we got that far, but. Um. Yeah, I mean, if we started to look at any sort of ultimately phase in, it would be helpful to get a sense of expected sales in commercial lots such as these yeah. in, in the Scarborough or the surrounding areas so that we know are we going to get that footage, square footage, um, in three years, five years, 15 years? Yeah. I, and uh, again, I go back to when will we know that we were right yeah. or wrong in, in the analysis that, that we did? So that's, that's what I would like to delve into a little bit, I think. Yep. Thank you. Uh, so just building on some of the, some of the recent comments here, I, I, I think we're on the right track. Um, based on you know, what Roger and, and Nick were saying about you know taking some of the some of the actual the data that you have and some of the other reference reference points and data points that are out there um, and developing kind of fleshing out some sort of methodology that 
so we can hang our hats on a little bit. Um, I think, you know, you, you run into the, you always run the risk with this sort of thing of, of running into the limitations of small sample size and then trying to extrapolate too much based on that with a very dynamic <coughs> real estate market. You know, who would have predicted 12 months ago what would be happening right now politically right. and economically? So um, I guess to me that that just argues for, you know, all other things being equal or when in doubt, err on the more conservative mm -hmm. side. Um, that just seems like the prudent thing to me. But um, that said, you know, we will look forward to seeing what you sort of come back with. And I think it would be interesting to see it in terms of, you know, different um, different floor areas and, and building heights um, and, and also be informed, uh, at least have as, as sort of, whether it's directly incorporated into the methodology or sort of there, sort of in the background um, or as added context, sort of some data about the frequency of turnover and development and what your assumptions are uh, going forward. Um, because I think once you get beyond a certain amount of time, that it just the, the the value of that any projection is going to diminish significantly, and that sort of gets to what, uh, what Rachel was sort of alluding to. You know that, um, and that's I. You've been wrestling with this, obviously. You know. Yeah, and and we, and we do have a lot of the data. Unknowns. A lot of the data that you're you're talking about, and we're we're gathering it and. I guess the reason we came in at, at this point is that, well, let's not inundate you with, with a lot of the data and get, you know, where we're heading. Um, so I think it was a useful conversation to have and, and, and hopefully you've gotten a good sense from the board. I think it's fair to say as a whole we're skeptical of the 30,000 and I think we're prone, to, we're, we're inclined to want to err on the lower side, but, but we're open to seeing what kind of a case you can you can make sure. using the data? Um, just as a quick side note, there was a question about, and this this is getting into the weeds a little bit, but question about how the clubhouse would be counted, mm. and I'm not sure how the town would approach that or how the ordinance would look at that, um, but I know in certain contexts, like the in sort of the low-income housing tax credit world that I'm familiar with, that something like that would count as residential as long as it was used exclusively by the residents um, and was not something that was bringing in, you know, independent revenue. Right. Uh, but that's that's, uh, that's uh, getting into the weeds. So um, hopefully that's useful feedback. And no, it is. It's, it's yeah. been a big help, and I appreciate everyone's, you know, kind of okay. thinking outside the box a little bit. All right. All right. Sure. Just one last question. Um, is the number of 10 units, multifamily units, is that is that the requirement to make it economically feasible to do it? I don't th think so. I, that was uh, th that was sort of a one particular developer's sort of vision for what was going on, and and in that respect, you know, you know, they have some fluff in their numbers. I I built in, you know, some factors of safety when I do things out and uh, I think that's all sort of you know to be determined as we go through um, and and certainly there's a whole host of issues as you get into this you know infrastructure costs connectivity you know where you're coming from impact fees all those things kind of it's a lot of sort of moving pieces and so we'll figure that out as we, we go along mm -hmm. um, just want to make sure that I say that I actually didn't sound at the beginning because I'm just totally overwhelmed by how this is going to work. But um, I like the concept a lot. It's nice land in there. Yeah. I think it would lend itself to this, and I think it'd be a real challenge for the board to take a look at how this gets implemented, and we start looking at things like design, and how does that affect the design of the commercial, and how does mm -hmm. the landscaping work, so that the commercial and the residential are working with each other. I mean, this could be very creative. So I just wanted to say it's not that I don't like the idea. I'm just overwhelmed by the mathematics of it. But, you know, we have to say Karen and I know we'd be very willing to talk with you. So thank and, you. Uh, and Hopefully. I'll just add real quickly, you will be, uh, my vision for this, and, you know, we've sort of been helping them with the sort of 
design features is that we had communal gardens and lots of walking trails and we wanted to make it more of a not your typical tennis courts, basketball courts type of thing, but you know, more connected to nature with the you get a garden plot and some bike storage and that stuff. So I, I I'm excited for what it can be and I, I hope that we can keep working towards it and get it there. Good. Well and hopefully too, um when when this comes back to us, staff will have made a little more progress with mm -hmm. the with the legal analysis and thinking yep. through some of those those mechanisms. But um but yeah I agree it is it is good to not lose sight of of the concept itself and hopefully we can get past past the, the math part of the test and well I, I hope to take the math out of it for you guys and Jay and I and Dan will all work out how that works and then they can rubber stamp it and that oh, works for me. But yeah. All right. Thank you very much Thank for your you. time. Good luck. Item number six. Divine Capital LLC requests preliminary subdivision and site plan review for 259 Payne Road, Assessor's Map R40, Lot 14, as part of the contract zone amendment. Okay. Yep. Thank you, Mr. Chair. As you just noted, um, this application is before the board for uh, what's considered sort of the preliminary site plan and subdivision review process as part of a contract zone amendment. Um, Essentially, the board's job at this time is to determine that the fundamentals of the plan are in place that can meet or exceed the town standards for site plans and, and subdivisions. And presuming that the board is generally comfortable with the direction things are headed and that the big picture elements are taken care of, um, understanding there might be some tweaks to the plan that need to happen along the way, but if the board's generally satisfied with the direction of things, uh, the board is being asked to consider a preliminary decision, so a preliminary approval, which that means the applicant then goes back to the council um, to con consider and ultimately make a decision um, on the contract zone amendment. Once and if the council adopts the contract zone, approves the contract zone amendment, it would come back to this board for final approval. The adoption of the contract zone by the council is a prerequisite important c component <laughs> of the board's approval because that actually establishes that what they're proposing to do, to do can happen per zoning. That's what the contract zone is about. So again, stepping back just a little bit, and I know we talked about this uh, when the applicant was before you at public hearing within the last uh, month or so. Um, so I'll just touch on it. The original contract zone for this par parcel was approved in 2007, at which time this was really identified as a, a companion piece to the Cabela side of the development, the Gateway Shops. This was considered the Gateway Square. There's going to be office space, hotel, daycare development on the site. Um, the applicant is now before the this board, the council, uh, with a request to go to, to 288 residential units, um, so an all residential development. Um, so, let's see, so, so that's sort of the background. Um, you have received staff comments, planning staff comments, as well as comments from uh, Woodern and Kern, our peer review engineers, uh, civil engineers, and Bill Bray, our peer review traffic engineer, um, looking at the, the issues. Um, so this is a very sizable project, but it benefits from the fact that there's been substantial review in the past and, and frankly, some l level of substantial infrastructure development on the site. Um, the off-site improvements have largely been completed and accomplished, uh, which really centered around the development of the, the Cabela site. The uh, internal sort of main thoroughfare, if you will, to this property has been uh, installed. Um, the bases and the, the stormwater pond is largely in place. So there's a lot of the, a lot of the main elements are already there. And now it's really about how does this particular design fit into all that. So with that, as I said, you have a, a number of staff comments. Um, I think staff is generally comfortable with that the fundamentals are in place. Um, and so I'll just touch on a couple of the elements that, um, to highlight, but, um, I think, you know, just some further consideration looking at the sort of connectivity of the, of the uh, within the lot, if you will, particularly between sort of the back uh, buildings and the, and the, ma uh, the main sort of 
area of the site around the on-site detention pond. Um, and in terms of interconnectivity, the applicant, based on some prior discussions, has uh, provided for interconnections with abutting properties, which is what the zoning seeks and the ordinances seek. So we're happy to see that and just want to be sure we're, we continue to develop the, the specifics around those. Um, one of the items that staff noted is that uh, the applicant is seeking 584 parking spaces, which exceeds the town's minimum. Not necessarily a problem, but again, where the board typically seeks to reduce impervious area for a host of reasons, particularly um, you know uh, natural impacts and stormwater. Just be sure we understand how the applicant came to their um, uh, desired number of parking spaces, and be sure the board satisfied with that. Um, a couple other elements that we flagged was again, um, there's uh, the site is currently subject to a, a DEP permit, and there's certain wetlands impacts that are associated with that permit. And so we, given that it's been a bit of time since the wetlands were delineated on site, we want to be sure that the, the areas of impact are, are well noted and understood, and, and it might be worth asking the applicant to sort of just re redelineate those areas where there's potential for impacts. Um, to be sure that grading and, and those sorts of things are, are being well accounted for. Um, I guess a, another sort of uh, uh, main element that uh, is worth, worthy of discussion, and I know our town engineer has already begun the discussions, has to do with some flooding issues the town has been experiencing on Payne Road since this development went in, and really being sure that we're understanding, you know, if there's any causes that are, are um, any cause of uh, the, the development on this site isn't having any causal effect on that, and if it is, are there ways to make improvements um, to alleviate those issues? Um, so I have to just sort of touched on some of the high points. Again, as staff noted, we have a lot of comments here, but we don't think that there's any that are really going to ostensibly modify the plan in any significant way. The applicant may disagree, and that's what we're here to hear about tonight. Um, so with that, Mr. Chair, I would turn it back yeah. to you. Thanks, Jay. And uh, the applicant here? I'm just wondering, I, I may need assist, assistance. I don't see the adapter that normally is here to uh, okay. this laptop. One second, Mr. Chair. Mm -hmm. Does this tie in? This There's usually an adapter. I don't know that. It always turns so out to be do you just have a uh, thumb drive? Because what yep. I can do is connect my computer up there, and then you can stick your thumb drive in this. Perfect. Drive from there. Thanks, Jay. Thank you. Thank you for your patience. Uh, I'm Bill Fletcher, attorney for the applicant, and uh, here before you again as part of our um, contract zone approval process. I'm here with other members of our development team tonight. Uh, David Yetton with KGI Properties. Uh, Tim Wentz with uh, Gate, uh, Gate 17 Architects. Uh, Brad uh, Weymouth, uh, Wayman f with um, the Simon Con Conover Group and uh, Will Conway with Sebago Technics, and uh, Will and Tim will be taking over uh, the lead of the presentation tonight. 
So as Jay mentioned, we're here tonight um, continuing on in the, the approval process. We're really seeking tonight the preliminary provisional approval um, of the site uh, plan, subdivision plan, um, so we can continue on. We know that we'll be back before you um, for final uh, subdivision site plan approval at a later date. Um, we've reviewed and digested the staff's report and uh, we're confident we can address uh, the issues and items identified in that report. Um, so without uh, any further delay, I'll turn this over to Will to uh, take you through the presentation. Thank you, Bill. Um, it's nice to be back before you. Uh, this has been a really great project as a designer to be working on uh, because I think this uh, project is going to be unlike anything else in Maine uh, with the uh, site amenity package. And we're going to get into some details tonight. Um, the project big, so it's tough to graphically uh, depict it, but we try to, uh, to start with a big picture, which I'll turn your attention to here. It shows the buildings, and then the orange um, line work is the pedestrian sidewalk network, which I think demonstrates a, a really good sense of interconnectivity uh, within the project. And then uh, these sort of uh, round circles that you'll see throughout the area are uh, patios that I think I explained at sketch plan that really evolved out of a meeting that I had with Jay in the fire department in terms of access. And I'll show you more details uh, about that. Then we have the entry at Hagus here, which will be a beautiful landscape statement. Uh, the common area, which is this area here in green, uh, which is a big green open space within the project. Uh, the pond, which we're sort of um, handling and designing more as a visual amenity, uh, not something that you really go to frequently, but a central um, visual amenity to the project. And then the clubhouse with the uh, recreation event area behind it. I think we uh, skipped over a slide here. It skipped one. <coughs> So we'll start here. This is the entrance at Hagus Parkway. Um, you may be familiar with these beautiful stone walls that were kind of built and abandoned. And then um, <coughs> we'll be doing heavily landscaped uh, areas uh, in front of those walls and on the top of the wall, sort of plants that will terrace down, cascade over the walls. And then we'll be introducing a center island here with a monument sign. Uh, and then some street trees that begin to um, define the corridor through the project. And you'll notice I, when I was here at Sketch Plan, the thing that you can see on this slide is we pulled the garages away from this entrance. And instead of those, uh, are, we're introducing landscape berms uh, with heavy plantings in that area so that when you enter the site, your views will be oriented to the first two buildings, uh, not to the garage buildings. Uh, this is a typical neighborhood in the project, and it shows uh, sort of the area of the uh, building, front of the buildings here with the, the two entrances, which Tim will talk to you a little bit about, and then the garages across the aisle with a, uh, a walkway here. The yellow symbols are the site lighting fixtures, and then this is one of those um, patios that occur throughout the project uh, that serve as an amenity for the residents to go out, read a book, have a lunch, um, whatever. But also a fire truck can pull into these areas from the, um, the driveway area itself. This area shows also the uh, edge of the pond here. And this sort of color here and up on the top between um, 
the areas for future development, we're going to be doing a wildflower seed mix. So it's a, we'll have maintained lawns in the front of the buildings, and I'll show you in a minute in the commons, but in uh, areas on the edge of the project and around the pond, we're proposing a more naturalized ground cover. This is the commons area here. Again, these are the first two buildings on the right as you enter from Hagus, and uh, you have a big open space, and you can notice this highlighted color would be earth berms complementing this area. And then uh, another ga gathering space here with benches um, along uh, the uh, principal access drive. This is the mail building uh, here with, again, another uh, patio fire lane feature uh, in this area here. And you can see in this slide um, the intensity of landscaping, not only in the fronts of the buildings, but also in the rear. Uh, we think that's uh, going to be a really attractive um, feature to the project. This walkway also will be illuminated with low bollards uh, lights, as well as all of the fire lane patios will have lower scale uh, bollard lighting at night. This is the uh, clubhouse area. Again, this is a major amenity, uh, uncommonly found in Maine. Uh, the building here, which Tim will talk to you about, uh, the pool area, there's grilling stations, there's um, a fire pit out here. It's a gathering space for the community. And then um, immediately to the rear of it is the recreation event area. It uh, depicts a, a volleyball size court here, and then this is a, a tent that might be used for a wedding reception or other um, community-sponsored um, events uh, during summer months. During winter months, this area will be used for snow storage. It will be a stabilized turf. Uh, so that uh, there's a central location in the project for snow storage. Uh, there are other areas for snow storage throughout the project, but this is a, a primary area uh, that would be envisioned to accommodate that in the wintertime. This is the central area of the project. Again, the pond here at the top, the bright uh, green area is a dog park which uh, these uh, people are allowed to have pets, uh, and this is a place where they can go and uh, meet other people with pets and have a place to play with the dogs in a fenced area. The red arrow is something that you may have seen in your staff comments, which is um, we'll be adding a walkway there. And this is predominantly for the buildings at the bottom of the screen and then way at the bottom of the project to provide better access to this uh, central area. So we'll be uh, providing that walkway um, as part of our uh, final plan submittal. And lastly, we brought this because it, uh, staff wanted to get some feeling of how the project would be phased. Uh, the clubhouse and these two buildings will be phase one. And then sort of working in a counterclockwise direction, the second, third, fourth, and then this will be the last phase uh, in this location. So I will conclude that part of our presentation and ask Tim to come up and walk you through the uh, building design, and then I'll wrap up, and then we'll entertain your questions at the end. All right. Thank you. My name's Tim Wentz. I'm one of the partners at Gate 17 Architecture out of Haddonfield, New Jersey. 
Um, our practice is solely devoted to doing apartment complexes throughout the eastern United States. The buildings that you're looking at are a <clears throat> 24 unit, three story slab on grade building. It consists of two cubes that are uh, entered through a common staircase and there's four units on each floor. So there's 12 units in one cube and 12 in another. If you look at the architecture, there's many things that we wanted to do to break down the massing of the buildings. <coughs> Uh, the first, and starting from the top and working our way down, is that we wanted to vary the roof line. We did not want it to be a single monolithic slab. And you can see that the ridge line uh, varies, and there's also a sectioning of the roof so that uh, it's not just, as I said, one monolithic slab. Uh, we are using a 6 and 12 uh, slope on the roof. And the material that we're suggesting is a architectural shingle that, although this wouldn't be the color, we would probably go into more of the grays. Um, you can see that it has a lot of uh, variation in it and it has a lot of uh, ins and outs to give it some relief. <coughs> The windows themselves are quite large. Uh, a typical window is three feet by five feet. And you can see in many instances that we have them doubled up and even tripled up. This is to give as much light as possible to the inside of the building uh, so that the apartments are feeling very light and airy. Uh, we have nine foot ceilings throughout. Uh, the other thing is that the uh, trim around the, the windows is going to be quite wide uh, so that it will give you a, a real sense of architectural detailing. The materials themselves for the facades uh, is predominantly a vinyl shake and it looks like this. This is a very high quality uh, vinyl material. It's very heavy duty uh, and this is the profile that we would have for the shapes. And in fact, this is one of the colors that we would be using. The second material is a lap siding. And what we do is we use a darker color for accenting of the lap siding and a lighter color for the, the shapes themselves because this is the predominant field. And you can see in this particular slide, that the colors we're using for the shake is a light tan and for the clabbered siding is a spruce green. So you can see up there that uh, the predominant field again is the tan of the shakes themselves. We also have certain window areas that uh, we have uh, AZAC panels between them and you can see uh, in the middle section there where there's a white area that's between the buildings. That's to give it a verticality. Uh, there's two main entrances that are located uh, where we have a, a, a gable roof and uh, these are the entrances to the staircases. Uh, these are accessible entrances and every single unit within the first floor of the building is handicapped accessible. Each, build, each unit has its own balcony. Uh, the balconies are approximately nine feet by six feet. Uh, they have an aluminum railing on them. Uh, this is so that the residents themselves can enjoy the outdoors uh, in good weather. And finally, you can see some grills uh, on, the, on, the, uh, on the building itself. And the grills are for the uh, the air conditioning systems because there are no condensers that would be located on the ground. They're actually built into closets which are on the balconies themselves. Now this slide, what you're looking at is the rear elevation and the side elevations. And what's important to note here is that we are carrying the level of detailing all the way around the building. Uh, 
uh, we're not doing that traditional Hollywood front and then just cheaping out on the, on the back sides of the buildings. The detailing is the same, the materials are the same, the fenestration is the same. And the sides, you can see that there's an enormous amount of fenestration. I'm showing here a floor plan, and, and I, I don't want to get into too much detail. It's in your package. Uh, but you can see that the layout is eight units per floor, and we have a combination of studios, one bedroom, one bedroom den, two bedrooms, two bedroom dens, and three bedrooms. Um, these are luxury apartments. Uh, the kitchens have granite countertops and stainless steel appliances. There is wood plank flooring uh, throughout the units, except in the, in the uh, bedrooms that will be carpeted. Uh, each unit has its own washer dryer, and as I said before, each unit has its own balcony. And then this is a typical floor, uh, which would comprise the second and third floor. Now, we have a second building, uh, which is a little bit longer than the first one to give us a variation in our apartments. Uh, this one is showing the gray color schemes, and uh, the detailing is pretty much identical to the first building that I showed you. And again, the side elevations and the rear elevation shows you that the detailing is the same around all four sides of the building. And again, the floor plan, this particular unit has the three bedrooms, the uh, two bedrooms, and the two bedroom dens in it. <coughs> That's the typical floor. And then the units themselves, and uh, again, as I said, the units uh, vary from a 600 square foot studio all the way up to a 1,300 square foot three bedroom unit. Now this is the clubhouse. Clubhouse is quite large. It's almost 5,500 square feet. Uh, the materials and the color schemes are the same as the, uh, the buildings themselves, but what we've added is a third material in that we will be doing a cultured stone along the uh, majority of the front and then creating a water table around the sides of the building. Again, the elevations to the sides and to the rear. <coughs> In the rear, which opens up into the uh, pool area, what we have is a very large trellis area which uh, covers a portion of the deck. Uh, and then there's the seating area itself, and then in the fenced-in area would be the actual pool. And the seating area will have a fire pit in it. It will have a barbecue area and other amenities. And here you can see the floor plan. And what we have is a large gathering room with a serving <coughs> kitchen. We have a business center. We have a card room. We have a pool room. We have a media room. We have a large fitness center with a yoga room. And we have the leasing offices themselves. And this will uh, be used by the residents. Uh, they can have it for parties, for functions. Uh, in some cases, they would actually allow uh, outside parties to rent it if the, if the management so desired. This is the male pavilion. Now, <clears throat> what this is going to have is all the mailboxes for uh, the center, and they are surrounded, the interior room there, uh, they go around the outside of the building on three sides. Now, in that room is a state-of-the-art package concierge system where UPS or FedEx or even uh, United Postal Service will come in and uh, drop off packages and then the package, uh, it, you actually get notified on your smartphone that a package is available with a code <coughs> and you can go to 
uh, this package center and retrieve your package 24-7. Now this is, uh, there's a couple things going on here. One is there's a small maintenance building that's approximately 20 by 20 that will service the uh, complex itself. And right next to that will be a 20 by 20 fenced in area where there will be a trash compactor and recycling bins and more detail on the front sign that Will has been talking about. Now. What we did with the garages is that we took the center section and we bumped it out so it would give some relief along the length of the garage. And where you see the rear elevation uh, that is, is rendered, that is the elevation where it is visible from the street, the back of the garages. And what we would do is we would put windows in the garages, we would do uh, some gable ends and we would do a trellis work where you would have planting materials that would go up a uh, trellis. Now this is a second type because within the garages uh, we have to have handicap accessible garages so that this elevation uh, you can see on the right hand side uh, is the handicap garage and there's a man door to get in it. It's an oversized garage bay. And then finally what we have are garages which are back to back and these are located more to the center of the project and they serve uh, both sides uh, for the buildings on both sides. And then again uh, the back to back garage will have uh, two accessible garages uh, which are required by code. So at this point, I'm going to turn the presentation back over to Will. <coughs> uh, thank you, Tim. And um, I'm going to just conclude by uh, asking for your support tonight um, to grant us the conditional preliminary approval so that we can uh, continue our process with the council. Uh, also to hear any feedback you have about adjustments that you want us to make before we come back with those final plans. And uh, thank you for your uh, patience and your attention to this project. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, before we go to board discussion, uh, we do have the opportunity for public comment. If there's anyone who would like to come on up and identify themselves and make any comments. Seeing none, we'll turn right to the board then. And uh, Nick, would you like to start us off? My turn. Um, <clears throat> I think I saw a note on staff comments about mechanicals. Are those are those rooftop hidden? No, uh, no. There will uh, there will be um, two in the rear of each building. Two small, you know, three foot by two foot um, units that are for the. Uh, central uh, common spaces within each building. And as Tim pointed out to you, the grills that related to the air conditioners, mm -hmm. those occur in the building. So there's nothing on the ground or on the roof. And then I, uh, I have a note here about parking spaces. So is the parking, um, is the parking count including the garage parking or is that just surface side pay, uh, Basically. That includes the garages, and um, let me talk a little bit about parking, and I may ask for some support, but um, I'll try to answer it to the best as I can. The um, goal of the project from the beginning was to get close to, and we did get close to, two spaces per unit. Um, because even a one-bedroom unit uh, often would be a young married couple that have two drivers. And in East Lyme, what happened was they did not design for two, and they had to construct after the fact. So we've designed it into the project to be built initially for close to that ratio. I, uh, I'm offering an opinion on the parking situation. I'm, um, I'm fine with the excess spaces. 
believe if I lived there, I'd probably invite people over quite a bit. So. <laughs> Uh, parking in this situation might be a good thing. I'm sorry, what um, I do. I mean, I have to say that uh, I guess there's some flooding issues that maybe you got to work through with potentially some flooding issues. On We're going to meet with the city engineer, mm -hmm. and if it's something that our project created, not us, but the people that, you know, we, we will take care of it. Okay. Uh, if it's something that we're not responsible for, we probably would not agree to it. But if if it's definitely as a result of the construction of what's been built to date that caused that problem, we will correct it. Okay. And then um, I, I, I got to tell you, it's um, it's a really nice project, and I think um, I think Scarborough's really going to benefit from this. If I had one criticism, is I think you missed by not incorporating a walking area around the pond. I I think such a natural feature like that people would enjoy walking around it but if that's the only thing you missed on I think you've done pretty darn good so thank you thank you good luck to you thank you thank you Nick um, before we continue on with the board um, I believe there may have been someone who did want to get up and speak who might have stepped out when we <laughs> offered that opportunity <laughs> so we'll let you uh, say your piece now <coughs> Well, it's Bangler, 233 Holmes Road. Um, good evening, everybody. I'm here concerned about the number of uh, people that will be living there and the impact that it will have on the infrastructure in town. I've been to the um, town council for several years because my taxes go have gone up 30% and my income has not gone up nearly that much. So, and I've been here since 62 so I've paid my way so I want to make sure that this development it's a great development I have no um, reservations about the construction or the quality but I do have a concern about the number of people that are going to live there and I heard one bedroom two bedroom and three bedroom so that means more than likely there will be at least two people per unit <coughs> and it sounds like there could be <coughs> some children there and some people might question my judgment on that but I know of some people that have million dollar houses that have kids in school in Scarborough so just the fact that it's uh, high end development doesn't mean there won't be an impact on the schools and I think that the impact fees that you are charging do not cover anywhere near the cost when you talk about uh, $800 or plus CPI adjustments per unit and then you look at this cost of educating one child it's twenty uh, thirteen thousand dollars plus a year you know you don't even come close to, to paying for that education and when you have to expand the school system which you're already talking about doing <coughs> it's just not enough that's all I want to say thank you thank you anyone else all right. uh, oh, oh, oh okay my name is Kenneth Fingler and uh, I live at 6 Mitchell Hill Road in Scarborough Maine and um, I'm here to echo some of the same concerns <coughs> my father has I do I look at this project and I see it as nicely constructed and uh, I do believe that it's a beautiful feature <coughs> and that I do un recognize that there is a housing crunch in the general area um, but I do also share some of the same concerns about the long-term uh, costs um, <coughs> as related to general infrastructure in our town <coughs> and the uh, and the costs of educating um, our children I've uh, <coughs> I've not taught the 38 some odd years that my mother did at Scarborough High School, but I've spent uh, five years in schools in Southern Maine, and I understand some of the costs that go with that. <coughs> I'm also a small business owner here in this town, and I understand uh, what goes along with expanding a business, or in this case, you know, uh, and maintaining a fleet and maintaining uh, facilities and so forth. And I too share some concerns about the long-term uh, 
costs of building and maintaining uh, adequate facilities and in, in, uh, delivering a quality education to our students. And I do question whether or not we ask enough of the builders and developers um, that bring these additional um, residents and families and kids to our town if they share enough of that long-term uh, cost. Um, I'm being a business owner, I <coughs> benefit from uh, new construction, as do a lot of people. And I think we get very excited about that because we recognize that there are jobs, um, both in the general construction and the maintain maintenance of these uh, um, buildings and so forth down the road. Um, but we also have a lot of infrastructure that we will have to maintain for years to come, um, be that schools, roads, um, expanding police force and other services. And I just want to make sure that we are really giving uh, strong consideration to what those costs are and are we going to, do we raise enough tax revenue really um, with these structures to deal with the costs of those services? And I appreciate your time. Thank you very much. Thank you. Anyone else? Okay, thank you very much. Roger? Okay, thanks. Uh, <coughs> I I, uh, I want to echo Nick's comments. I think it looks like a terrific project. And uh, I'm very impressed with the buildings and everything, the architecture and, and what you're doing. Um, just a couple of questions. Um, you mentioned where the maintenance building is. That's where the trash is going to be centralized? Correct. Uh, so people, for instance, in... White pine and red pine, they, what are they going to have to do? Take their trash up to there? Yes. So think about it as like a suburban transfer station. Uh, many people, like my daughter lives in Arundel. She drives her trash to the transfer station. Okay. This is a much shorter drive. You do that on your way to work, on the way to get mail. And what they found um, in their other projects is it's good to have it central or you know, so you don't have scattered dumpsters throughout the project with trash and rodents and things. If you keep it in one place, then the staff can manage it. Um, and so it's just a much uh, more efficient, cleaner way to handle it uh, and less disruptive than having trucks, you know, raising those things up all around the project. It happens. You know, they, this is a much quieter operation. It's not dumpsters. It's a compactor. It gets access less frequently. The truck comes, loads it up, takes it away, puts a new one down. It's a much quieter operation and um, a much better solution to the, the trash problem. Okay. Um, you, you had mentioned also, I think it was you, uh, the, uh, the recreation area would be where the snow remo removal would go, the storage, snow storage? Yes. Would it, and I, th I think I saw somewhere else on one of these other prints, there's a few other areas where you plan to put snow too. Yes. Is it, you feel that's adequate, what you have there? Depends. On a winter like this, you're going to need this area behind the recreation okay. area. But on a light winter, probably not. Um, at the last meeting, too, um, wasn't there a discussion about um, connectivity with the abutting properties? Yep. Um, with that in mind, I know um, to the south where Scammon's property is, that's primarily all pond for the most part, right? And the property over here to the west, the Adams property, mm -hmm. I was looking on the tax maps and I noticed that there's some access to uh, Payne Road. <coughs> so I, I don't think that's really going to be a major issue with this here, this property, in connect, uh, in, you know, the connectivity. Yeah. So. I just point out that the zoning seeks to create connections between properties to uh -huh. sort of enable inner, <coughs> excuse me, to enable traffic to flow between pro properties. Um, so that they don't have to use Payne Road or Highest Parkway to sort of limit the <coughs> traffic on, on the main 
roads and I think there was a plan earlier as part of the presentation that showed some arrows where those interconnections were proposed. Are those the blue so, arrows? Yeah, yeah. the blue arrows. So um, sort of the areas you were just identifying because yeah, I think when a staff looked at the Scammon property that has a number of ponds, there is okay. a lot of development capacity on that lot. Okay. Um, and actually, um, uh, you know, the Adams property has been on the market. And mm -hmm. so there's likely to be development that occurs on that property as well. Okay. Um, I don't, I, I, I think you've uh, responded to a lot of the um, staff's comments regarding, you know, like access to different. We don't take any issues with staff comments <laughs> in, in terms of, um, you know, being responsive to them. <laughs> in any in any uh, motion or, or action tonight would be preliminary, so it'd still would still be time to work through yeah. some of the loose ends. I mean, I I don't really have any any further questions. Thanks, Susan. I don't have <coughs> a lot of other. Goodness, we're all clearing our throats tonight. <coughs> suggestions either. Um, I'd like to just make a comment. Is it okay to the folks that made a comment? Absolutely. Um, I really understand what you're saying, and I'm, it's not that the board can do anything about you, but it's a it's a wonderful opportunity to go ahead and have a public opportunity to say that sort of thing, and also because I am a personal <coughs> bandwagon leader for the new comprehensive plan. <laughs> So we are coming up with a new comprehensive plan and we really do need all of the town residents to be involved and the kinds of things that will be discussed at the um, meetings before the comp plan is developed will impact on the kind of infrastructure questions you have. So make sure you come to those meetings. Thank you. Um, as for this project, I think it's, it's coming along nicely. Um, kudos for the wildflower seeds. That's totally brilliant. It just needs to make sure it gets watered because if we <laughs> if we yeah. have a, you know yep. I just wanted to say yay. Um, parking. You say two per unit. So the ones that I see that are outside the buildings will constitute part of those. That's not guest parking. You well, have, we have garage parking and we have extra parking outside. Yeah, so the two, is, you have to add them all together. So, okay. so if I'm what you're saying, surface parking plus garage is about two. So where, what, what happens if I'm a guest? <coughs> you would be able to access the property. This but is their experience in their other projects. But where do, I <coughs> where do I park? You would not park in a garage if you were a visitor. You would park. Woo. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, so we have a garage, and that's for the people who are residents. And then out in front of the garage, we have lined parking spaces, okay? So I'm assuming that I can come in, and the person I want to visit is in building A, number 12. Yeah. And I, I'm not going to go into the garage. But oh, I building A, Susan. It has a name of a tree. Okay. Sycamore 12. Or White Oak. <laughs> or White Oak. I'm just trying to make sure that people are not going to have problems finding places to park when they come in to visit. You know, this is no on-street parking here. Correct. So I'm not saying that there's going to be a magical answer to this, but I think it needs to have striping, wording, something, so that when I come in, I know where I can park and where I can't park. That's all. I don't want to make a big deal about it. Yeah, okay. I have never seen a development quite like this mm -hmm. where... To get anywhere, you have to go between garages. You know, I mean, you can't get there from here. You just have to go around in circles. You do, and you just follow the <coughs> garages. It's just very odd. <laughs> I, I even I just we're going to make an adjustment, as I pointed out in um, in that location. Okay. I'll be interested. I don't have any. Uh, let's just say I don't really have any problems for first. Approval. I have a lot of questions. So when you come for final approval, I'm not going to try to ask all my questions, but I don't think we can expect that there will be approval for the second, the first time you show up. Fair enough. We'll come as many times as you want us. Okay, good. Then I, I'm, I'm okay. <coughs> oh, yes, and when you come back, I hate to do this, but I, I, I don't want to drive <laughs> staff crazy. <coughs> I'm the landscape person, and no matter what it is, that happens. I can't read these things. So would you please, when you make the next submittal, 
take the landscaping pages and make them like you know. Make we'll make a full size copy and put Susan on it. Yes, and and make it so that I haven't got to use a magnifying glass to read what it is you're going to use for landscaping. Okay. Okay. Thank you very much. Thanks. Thank you, Rachel. Yeah. Um, Kudos on, on this project. I, I really do um, like it. I appreciate the care and the details that have gone into it. Uh, one of the things that was helpful to me is uh, <coughs> when you mentioned that the clubhouse would be in the first phase uh, of development, and so often the amenities are left until the very end, mm -hmm. and the folks who moved in early <laughs> are waiting a couple of years before they get what they thought they were going They're to get. They're going to get spoiled. To get, yeah. So that's that's um, that's a wonderful uh, attraction to folks, and and I'm glad it's in the first phase. I agree with Nick that uh, maybe a walkway around the pond might be a very nice place to stroll. Um, wildflowers on the side, uh, some sort of a path around there that would be great. Uh, I actually. Uh, I was intrigued by the way you've presented the studio apartments. I, I liked um, the layout of those. It wasn't just some giant room, and um, but thoughtfully done for uh, a young professional, maybe the first time out uh, and on his or her own. Last time uh, I had a question around storage, and I still have some questions around storage. There's no such a thing as too many closets. Um, and young professionals are very and older folks are very likely to have bikes and while there may be bike racks I still don't see a place to store the bikes over the winter uh, you might want to take a look at putting some sort of bike rack to hang them inside a garage if there's space um, wire shelvings inside a garage some place for people to put some of their possessions when they downsize perhaps that they didn't want to get rid of but they <coughs> don't want to rent a storage unit. So I would take a look at that uh, as, a, as a possibility. Okay. Um, I think this is great. Thank you. Thank you. Right. <coughs> Thank you. Um, yeah, I think definitely on the right track as well. Um, everything that we've seen looks great. Um, uh, I appreciated the, the thorough uh, presentation and, and, the, and the renderings and, and all the detail there. In terms of the architecture, um, um, I think we always appreciate seeing the effort, those efforts made to, to break things up and provide some architectural interest in a way that's not just sort of arbitrary or, or just window dressing and, and along those lines. Um, I think it's great that, that each elevation is given given that level of attention so it's not just the you know the Hollywood front as as was stated by your architect um, and that's something that we sometimes have to push and pull on a little bit so um, I think that's um, you know that's definitely a, a, a big positive for this um, I do and I, I don't remember any of the board members speaking to this um, but I, I will agree with staff's recommendation that given the amount of time that's gone by, um, the, the wetlands redelineation is probably appropriate. So I would ask that um, you go ahead and, and do that, um, just you know, given the scale of this and again, the time that's elapsed um, since it was last done. Um, and the, the comments on the Payne Road flooding, flooding are, are, are well taken. Um, you know, we, we never look for whoever happens to be the next one through the door to solve all the world's problems, but at the very least we want to make sure we don't make it anything worse. Um, just want to make sure I'm connecting all the dots here. Um, some good comments about connectivity. Um, I agree about the pond and a couple of the other comments along those lines. Um, and I also uh, appreciate the public comment and the concerns about um, pressure on town services and, 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 and the budget and so often it ends up being about the schools and that is a flashpoint in, in town here, no doubt about it, but it, it, there also are other considerations as well, other infrastructure, road capacity and things like that and as Susan alluded to, 
Uh, this is timely because we are about to embark on a, on a comprehensive plan update, so there will be opportunities to weigh in on that, and we hope people participate in that. Um, you know, there are people at the council level and, and others and, and planning staff who are spending a lot of time already looking at the uh, financial implications of these things, and certainly a project like this um, will bring substantial property taxes to the town. What that net impact ends up being, you know, is beyond the purview of the planning board, certainly, but those are valid concerns to raise. And I will say that in addition to the, the comprehensive plan process that um, that this will, this particular project will be going back to the council because it is part of the contract zone amendment. So presumably there will be another opportunity at that level and as part of that process to, <coughs> to weigh in as well. Um, so again, certainly some loose ends, but I don't see anything that would prevent us from um, uh, issuing preliminary approval tonight and then go back to the council and assuming you come back to us, um, we'll drill down and as we said, take as much time as we need to take to get, get through and um, get final. Um, so with that, I will, uh, I don't have a big fancy motion here, but I'd move to grant preliminary subdivision and site plan approval to Divine Capital LLC for 259 Payne Road, Assessor's Map R40, Lot 14, as part of the contract zone amendment. Second. We have a second. Any discussion? Any further discussion? All in favor? That's unanimous. Thank you. Thank you. And good luck. You can just leave it up there for now. I'll grab it at the end of the meeting. Thank you. a staff report? Uh, yep, just want to mention a couple of things to the board. Just let you know that uh, staff has conducted a pre-application review for the 25 Plaza Drive site. That's the uh, one right here at Oak Hill where we did a, um, a site walk not too long ago. So oh, yeah. I would expect that to come back to the board um, pretty soon. And we have received and will be conducting a pre-application review for the property that uh, Rosbera Construction is looking to do off of Muzzy Road, the uh, uh, apartment complex up there. And then the other item I just want to touch base on, because it's been in the news and had a couple of phone calls, is regarding 62 Muzzy Road. Uh, there was some clearing in the site of the Asian Fusion restaurant. Um, oh, yeah. So, yeah. So, <laughs> so uh, there's, there's been a notice of violation issued for that site, and I uh, just want to let the board know that staff and DEP are working through that, and um, we're, we'll continue to work on that and monitor the site, and it's likely um, that you know, the board can expect to hear more from us on that item moving forward. So just wanted to let you know what's going on with that. Um, that is what I have to report. I don't know if Angela has anything she wants to chime in on. Yeah, I do. <laughs> <laughs> um, we're having a public meeting for Phillips Brook Watershed Management Plan coming up on Monday at the Dunstan Fire Station at 6.30. Um, Robin Saunders is our um, planning board representative on the steering committee. And she's planning on being there, but um, it is open to the public and open to get um, some good feedback from some of the stakeholders in the watershed from that. Um, and then looking forward, we're hoping to come up with some, some draft recommendations that we'll present at a, hopefully a joint workshop between Planning Board and Conservation Commission and our steering committee um, and try to get some feedback from, from all of you um, before we move forward with finalizing a draft for the watershed management plan because a lot of that's going to have to do with some ordinance changes and things like that and some um, looking at development and how we do development within Phillips Brook in the future. Um, and then the last thing I just wanted to say was to thank Roger Beely for agreeing to be our liaison for the Transportation Committee. <laughs> it was a contract. <laughs> <laughs> thank you, Roger. Looking forward to that. So thank you, Roger. Thank you. Great. Thanks. I was actually going to ask if... <laughs> Did you do anything on that? Did you want to do it, Corey? No, that's all right. <laughs> <laughs> um, do we have an administrative amendment report? Nothing to report nope. this meeting. Okay. Any planning board correspondence? 
Nope, I don't have any to report either. Any planning board comments? I just have one for Jay. What, the, um, the house that's next to the Asian Fusion mm -hmm. area, there was this mass. Mm -hmm. <laughs> that, so yeah, that, so. What's going on with that? Well, that, that site, um, so the DEP um, regulates streams and there's a, um, so that site is also under review by DEP because it, even though it's a residential site, you still can't cut within 25 feet of the stream. So that is sort of under the DEP's jurisdiction where, you know, the town, we don't have local regulations necessarily around that, so, um, but that's being looked at as well. Okay, I just wondered because it, it seemed like the same people who were doing their cutting. I believe that, yes, it was, a, it's my understanding it was the same contractor did the work and actually those properties I believe are in, if not the same ownership, it's, it's oh, okay. it, uh, one under one, one umbrella as I understand it. Okay. But Okay. Yep. All right. Make a motion to return. Make a motion to return. To, to return. To, to return. Yes. Make I'll a motion that. to return. <laughs> All in favor. Thank you.